What up, people? A couple months ago, I made a video showcasing some of the essential RPGs for the Nintendo Switch. And since the Switch has so many RPGs to choose from, I decided to make a part two so people could have even more games to play. If you haven't seen the first video, a link to it will be in the description below. And if there's a game you think I'm missing, I might have already talked about it in part one, so check it out afterwards. Or just leave it in the comment section. But before we start, if you're new to the channel, I make videos of single player games with a heavy focus on RPGs, if you can already tell. If that's something that interests you and you end up enjoying the video, consider subscribing and hitting that like button to help with the algorithm. And with that, here are 10 must buy RPGs for the Nintendo Switch, part two. Starting off the list, we have Death's Door. Released in 2021, Death's Door is an action adventure RPG that is kind of in that Soulsborne genre and was published by Devolver Digital. You'll be taking control of a crow who works as a reaper collecting souls for the Reaping of Mission headquarters. After defeating a monster on your first mission, an older large crow steals the soul and tells you about the disappearance of other crows. After that, the old crow tells you to go collect three giant souls needed to open Death's Door. When you first start off, you have a sword and a bow and arrow. Sword strikes string together into combos and ammo for the bow is replenished by using the sword. Four other weapon and three magic projectiles become available as the game progresses, but the basic attack mechanics remain. Health is recovered by collecting and planting seeds in pots that appear throughout the world. The seeds grow into plants that restore full health and eventually regrow. Doors to and from the afterlife area exist as checkpoints throughout the game, and when the player dies, they respawn at the nearest door without otherwise losing progress. While I typically don't play games like this that are designed specifically to be challenging, Death's Door never made me upset when I would die. If I did die, I knew it was my fault and the boss or enemy I lost to never felt like an insurmountable task to get through. Also, I really just love the art style of this game. While I'm slowly caring less and less about graphics over time, I do still appreciate games that go out of their way to look good, and Death's Door definitely falls into that camp. The only reason I didn't finish this game is because I stupidly dropped the game right before a boss fight, and that's the worst place to try and get back into rhythm with the combat. But anyway, Death's Door is one of the few games in the souls borny genre that doesn't make me want to throw my controller out the window. And for that reason alone, I can't recommend this action RPG enough. Sticking with the action, next up we have Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom Princess Edition. This edition comes with the base game and all of its DLC. Years ago, I randomly bought the steelbook for this game for like 20 bucks at Best Buy just because it looked like one of those Studio Ghibli movies. I wasn't really expecting much when I bought it, but I actually had a pretty fun time with it. Like I said earlier, the combat is your standard real-time action that focuses a lot on melee attacks. You also have what's known as Hickledees, I think that's how you say it, that will assist you in battle and will represent one of six types. Those types being normal, water, fire, wind, light, and dark. Outside of the standard melee combat, you'll also have skirmishes which involve you fighting off hordes of enemies. The game will also have you slowly building Evan's kingdom, who's also the king, I don't know if I mentioned that, throughout your time playing. I believe the skirmishes and base building is mostly optional, outside of a few you have to do, like story-wise. So I skipped them, but that didn't have anything to do with the quality of those modes. I just, it didn't really interest me much. Also, just like Death's Door, a unique art style will grab my attention right away, and this game is honestly just nice to look at. I just recently found out that Studio Ghibli actually had a part in the game, which makes the art design make much more sense, and honestly it might make the game worth buying just for that alone. My only real gripe with this game is that it's way, way too easy, and I'm by no means a guy who needs a challenge every time they play a game. I mean, one of my favorite franchises is Kirby for crying out loud. However, even on the hardest difficulty, I felt like I didn't really have to do much to win the battles I was in, which is why I eventually dropped it. However, if difficulty or lack thereof isn't a big deal to you, then this beautiful JRPG is one that Switch owners should definitely pick up. At number 8, we have a JRPG that just released last week with Eoden Chronicle 100 Heroes. I've been looking forward to this game ever since I backed the Kickstarter four years ago. The game was made by Rabbit and Bear Studios, who was mostly comprised of former developers of the Suikoden series, including series creator Yoshitaka Murayama. The game is turn-based and up to six units can be on your side of the battlefield at once, three in the front and three in the back. Every character has a range of either short, medium, and long, which will determine where and how far their attacks can reach. Units with a short reach have to be up front to do any damage, and the rear should probably be used for long range attackers, healers, and units who may not have the best physical defense as they're harder to hit back there. Magic is used by equipping rooms to your units in the available rune slots. As units level increases, more slots will become available over time, and depending on the room, you'll have a different set of abilities or spells. Unfortunately, only certain runes can be used by certain units, which was kind of annoying at first, but I got over it quick. So far in my playthrough, I'm really enjoying the characters I've met and recruited onto my team. They've all had different personalities and it makes it fun to try and find all 100 of them. And once I recruited a healer who while attacking enemies tells them to suck it, I knew I had a real winner on my hands. 
I don't have any personal gripes with the game, but the big glaring issue with this game right now is actually with the performance, specifically on the Nintendo Switch. As of the time I'm writing this, many people on the game subreddit have talked about how poorly the game runs on Nintendo Switch. Frame drops, long loading times, and bugs involving recruiting units have been mentioned frequently among Switch owners. Now, from what I've gathered, none of it is making the game unplayable, but a lot of Switch players are understandably frustrated. Now, the game runs perfectly fine on other platforms like the PS5 or the Steam Deck, but if you really want it on the Switch, I would strongly recommend waiting for a few patches to get sent out first. But putting performance aside for a second, if you're a fan of the old Suikoden games or just turn-based JRPGs in general, Eoden Chronicle 100 Heroes is 100% a must-buy. Next up, we have Hogwarts Legacy. This open world RPG lets you feel like a student straight out of the Harry Potter books. You'll be playing as a fully customizable student who, after you get sorted to your respective house, will be attending classes where you can learn how to cast spells, grow magical plants, brew potions, and also learn how to fight, which will all lead to you discovering your old fighting style. Through in-game challenges, you can earn experience points to gain levels, which allows a player to access and upgrade different spells, talents, and abilities. These challenges come in the form of combat, quests, and also exploration. You'll also have the ability to establish friendships with NPCs. As these relationships grow over time, your schoolmates become companions who can accompany you on your journey, expand your abilities, and offer unique companion quests as players learn their stories. Despite a wee bit of controversy surrounding the game, it has mostly gotten positive reviews and reception with Mace's 84 on Metacritic understandable. And as far as performance goes, I don't own it on the Switch, but every video I've seen says it runs surprisingly well for an open world game. Also, I'm constantly surprised at how many games can run and also run really well on Nintendo Switch. I still don't know how they got Borderlands 3 on there, but here we are. Also, fun fact, right now Hargrove's Legacy is on sale for 35 bucks on the eShop until May 13th, just thought I'd let you know. Whether you're a fan of the Harry Potter franchise or not, Hogwarts Legacy is an amazing game and I would even recommend it to people who may be a little burnt out with open world RPGs. Next we have a game from one of my favorite franchises as a kid, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. These latest additions to the series take you to the Paldea region and are the first mainline Pokemon games to fully embrace open world. After you pick your first starter Pokemon, pick Quaxley, and doing a little bit of story stuff, you can pretty much go where you want, barring a few places where certain abilities may be needed. Whether it's catching Pokemon, challenging gyms, fighting tiny Pokemon, or taking down base camps, you have the freedom to do what you want, when you want. However, keep in mind that you'll probably end up going to an area where everyone is like 25 levels above you and you get destroyed, so just be a little cautious. As far as the main differences between Scarlet and Violet, outside of a few Pokemon here and there, including the ones on the cover, Scarlet's theme is based more on the past with a more prehistoric aesthetic, and Violet is more futuristic with its theme. There's also a different professor, school, and school color theme between the two entries. I've wanted an overworld Pokemon game ever since I played Pokemon Coliseum and Gale of Darkness when I was a kid. While not fully open world, I feel like they were a necessary stepping stone to get where we are today. Now as far as performance on the Switch goes, let's just say it leaves a lot to be desired. All just aside, this game had a lot, and I mean a lot of issues around the time it launched from a technical standpoint. Crashes, bugs, frame drops, lagging, you name it, it had it. I'm not sure how much of that stuff is currently gone because I haven't played it in a while, but from what my experience was, nothing happened that made the game completely unplayable, for me. Now you might be asking why would I put a game with so many issues on a must buy list. Easy, the game was still really fun. While the bugs and overall jankiness were beyond frustrating, I still had a very good experience playing through Pokemon Violet. If all the technical problems are a deal breaker for you, I completely understand, but despite its many flaws, I would still strongly recommend giving Pokemon Scarlet or Violet a chance. Also pick Quaxley. Kicking off the top 5, we have another game that's slightly Pokemon-ish, and that's Shin Megami Tensei 5. If you're not familiar with the series, if you took Pokemon and decided to make it a Dark Souls game, you'd get Shin Megami Tensei 5. Similar to Persona games, a lot of your time will be spent recruiting Personas, well in this case demons, and having them fight for you and also being able to fuse them to create even stronger demons. The type of demon you get is determined by the races of demons used as well as their initial levels. And on top of their initial base skills, the fused demon also gets its skills by you selecting from the parent's demon's moveset. But unlike Persona, the Shin Megami Tensei series is meant to be much more punishing, and 5 is no different. Luckily, there are lower difficulties to choose from, which I've actually seen a lot of hardcore Shin Megami Tensei fans recommending for beginners. Now, this next part is really important. Keep in mind that an upgraded version to this game titled Shin Megami Tensei 5 Vengeance is going to be released soon in June. 
Some of the features that are coming in this upgrade include additional demons, a revamped story, more playable characters, a unique skill for every individual demon, and other quality of life enhancements. While the vanilla version is still perfectly fine, I would strongly, strongly recommend waiting for this upgraded version. Me adding it to this list right now was more of a way just to put it on your radar until Vengeance comes out June 14th. But whether it's the old or upcoming new version, if you're a fan of Persona, Atlas, or you've just always wanted a Pokemon Dark Souls game, Shin Mikami Tensei 5 is an essential to your Nintendo Switch library. Just missing out on the top 3 spot we have Fire Emblem Engage. Compared to Fire Emblem 3 Houses, a lot of people greatly prefer the combat in Engage. A big part of that is likely because of the return of the Weapon Triangle mechanic. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the Weapon Triangle mechanic returns with the popular Rock Paper Scissors format of Swords over Axes, Axes over Lances, and Lances over Swords. However, Neutral Engage is a new mechanic that involves the introduction of fist weapons which have the advantage over magic, bows, and daggers. One of the biggest complaints I had with Three Houses was map variety, or lack thereof, and thankfully the maps in my opinion with Engage are much more well designed and the variety of the maps have also greatly improved. Engage also goes back to that old formula of having one focused story instead of having three or four different story paths. While I personally prefer the multiple story paths like Echoes and Three Houses, I feel most people will prefer this more linear narrative. A common criticism with Engage from Fire Emblem fans is the designs of the characters, specifically the main protagonist. A lot of them feel that the designs and overall aesthetic of the units are too bright and cartoony and it makes it really hard to take a story depicting war seriously that involves them. While it doesn't bother me personally, probably because I watch a lot of anime, compared to characters from previous entries, the new designs could be off-putting to some, so just keep that in mind. I'm a huge Fire Emblem fan and what I noticed during my time playing the game is how much I prefer the more linear format to the levels. It feels more akin to the 3DS games as opposed to 3 Houses. Don't get me wrong, Three Houses is still my favorite Fire Emblem game by far, but I might prefer Engage's more linear approach over Three Houses' social stuff at the Monastery. It seems the consensus with Fire Emblem Engage from people who loved and hated it is that the gameplay is reminiscent of the beloved 3DS games like Awakening and Fades, but the story is noticeably weaker than that of Three Houses. So, if you're looking for that old school Fire Emblem gameplay and can overlook an average story and some questionable character design choices, then I think Fire Emblem Engage can be a lot of fun, especially for newcomers to the series. Starting off the top 3 we have Final Fantasy 7. Despite me playing this for the first time this year in January in preparation for Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, it's clear to see why this JRPG is so beloved and has remained so relevant for almost 30 years. The material system might be my favorite game mechanic of all the RPGs I've ever played. The thing I like the most about it is that it can be as simple or as complex as you want. You can just give everybody their own element material with an additional buff and or debuff material and just call it a day. Or you can play around with different combinations and see what works with specific characters' strengths and weaknesses and have some really incredible builds. While I didn't do much of that during my first playthrough, when I eventually play through it again, which I absolutely will, I'll definitely spend more time playing around with different attack spells and summon materials. It did take a while for me to get used to the slightly different way this game does turn-based combat, but once I got the hang of it, it was really satisfying. The music in this game is nothing short of phenomenal and the cast of characters you meet along your adventure all leave a lasting impression. Now to be fair, I played this game using a mod that added voice acting to the game on PC so that helped the characters feel more real to me as opposed to them not speaking at all. The characters all feel fleshed out and despite their main goal being the same, they all have very different and distinct personalities, motives, and perspectives on everything that happens to them. And the main story is also amazing with a lot of twists, betrayals, and some surprising alliances. My only two real issues with the game was the map navigation and some of the mini games you were forced to do. A lot of times it was really frustrating trying to figure out where to go next, and little mini games like leaving markers down in a snowstorm or having to constantly tap a button to keep cloud warm when climbing up a mountain all felt tedious and unnecessary. But despite those few criticisms I have for the game, it's easily one of the best games I've ever played. Final Fantasy VII is regarded by many, including myself, as one of the greatest RPGs ever made, and this is a game all Switch owners should have in their library. Sticking with turn base, just missing out on the top spot, we have Sea of Stars. The game was made by Stabish Eye Studios, who are also developers of the popular indie platformer The Messenger, which was released in 2018. This turn-based RPG is a love letter to classic games like Super Mario RPG, Illusions of Gaia, and probably the biggest influence, Chrono Trigger. Everything down to combat, story, exploration, and music was built with the old 16-bit era in mind, and you can see it when playing or watching the game. Speaking of combat, just like in Chrono Trigger, Sea of Stars has no random encounters, and instead, the battles start right where the interaction begins as opposed to transitioning to an alternative battle screen. 
Also, similar to Super Mario RPG, time hits are a major gameplay mechanic that's utilized. Every single action can be improved to deal more damage, heal more, or have some additional effect which is typically done by pressing action right before an action finishes. The time hit mechanic really kept me engaged throughout my entire playthrough. Even during times where it was getting a little repetitive, always trying to give the most damage while lessening the damage I received in return made me always focused even during the most mundane fights. And later on when they add two player combos, magic orbs, spell locks, and ultimate attacks to the mix, it requires much more strategy during fights and takes the gameplay to a whole nother level. Like most of the games on this list, the music is incredible. So much so, I even ordered the vinyl. Whether you're lost, exploring, or just trying to get to your next destination, the music in this game makes it that much more enjoyable. Despite some minor problems with the ending, the story was also rather enjoyable too, and you might not even have the issues I had with the narrative choices that were taken. But putting story and gameplay aside, Sea of Stars is a shining example of what a group of talented and passionate people can do, even without a AAA budget. So if you're as much of a fan of turn-based RPGs as I am, do yourself a favor and pick up Sea of Stars. And at number one, we have Witcher 3. While Horizon Forbidden West or Final Fantasy VII Rebirth might have the better open world as far as visuals go, the open world of Witcher 3 has this lived-in feel that I haven't gotten from any other game since. What helps with that is the many regions, cities, and villages you'll find that are filled with friends, enemies, and lore that really add to the immersion and overall enjoyment. What finally got me hooked with Witcher 3 was the main and side missions involving the Bloody Baron. After the main mission with him was done, I didn't really like him that much, which you're not really supposed to though, but it wasn't until I played through his optional missions that while still not being a big fan of his, I feel like I understood him and his motives much more that I wouldn't have if I didn't play those optional quests. It's that level of character development and storytelling that I always look for in games, and Witcher 3 makes it so common throughout the entirety of the game that it honestly left me a little spoiled when playing other games afterwards. Also, the two expansions in the game are amazing. A lot of people tell you the Blood and Wine expansion is better than the main game itself, and while it is my favorite of the two, the Heart of Stone expansion is no slouch in the department in any way. As far as performance goes, Witcher 3 is actually known as being one of the better ports to be brought over to the Nintendo Switch. It's incredible that they got the game to run so well on the Switch, and I don't remember if you get 60 frames or not, but I just remember enjoying my time playing it on handheld, and I didn't really care about that stuff. Witcher 3 is still to this day the best game I've ever played. While the combat is often the one thing criticized the most, I don't think it's so bad to not try the game out, but it will feel a little off if you're used to playing modern action RPGs. But when it comes down to it, between the stories, characters, exploration, and the amazing lore, if you're one of the few people who haven't played Witcher 3 for whatever reason, whether it's on the Nintendo Switch or not, this is the first game on this list that you need to play. But I'm really interested to hear what you guys think. What are some essential RPGs for the Nintendo Switch? Let me know in the comments. If you missed part one or just want to see some more RPG content from me, links will be in the description or just click the playlist on the screen. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe to keep up with the channel. Later.